Hello, good evening, and uh, sorry for the slight delay. Uh, uh, it's time for the Express Adda again. And uh, a lot of you are familiar with, uh, with Adda, but just for those who aren't, it's the Express Group's uh, own way of um, calling in people of interest, calling people who, have, who are doing things, who are in the process of doing things, which have a, a fundamental impact on our lives. And some really uh, fundamental things, uh, you know, some of our guests are very special. We bring you, we brought you actors, we brought you musicians, politicians, some former presidents of India have been here. And with every guest, we hope to interact, to chat with them, to draw them out, and essentially sort of leave this place a little wiser, uh, a little uh, more informed than we are at the start of it. And it's a pleasure to Today to welcome Dr. Siddharth Mukherjee uh, to Adda. A very warm welcome, uh, Siddharth. <laughs> Dr. Mukherjee is based in the US now. He's an oncologist, he's a physician, he's a researcher, he's a scientist, and uh, perhaps best known for, for most of us here and outside for his Pulitzer winning pri uh, book. Uh, on cancer, the, uh, the biography of cancer, and more recently, the book Gene and Intimate History. But other than that, he's a Rhodes Scholar. He's an uh, Associate Professor of Medicine at Columbia. <laughs> yeah, all right. So uh, I'll, I'll cut, cut that. And essentially, uh, what interests us with Dr. Mukherjee is, of course, his path-breaking fundamental res research that he's engaged in, his ideas on uh, you know, the history of medicine that he talks about, the history of the disease, and the work that he does, which is at, at the boundaries of, of medicine science and culture. So we hope to explore some of those intersections and things in our conversation with him. And uh, what's also really interesting with uh, Dr. Mukherjee is for a lot of us who are trapped in this binary of science and uh, uh, humanities, so uh, you know he's in some senses the perfect bridge and we hope that you'll help us uh, on that journey of for a lot of us who are non-specialist and um, do things. So may I request my colleague Paramita Chakravarti to kick this off. Thank you, Seema. Um, I'm going to start the conversation, Dr. Mukherjee, by asking you about your writing. You know, we've had a lot of very insightful books from writers like Oliver Sacks, of course, um, Atul Gawande, Paul Kalanithi. What does writing mean to you? Is it a, some sort of a release? Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Um, can I be heard in the back? Yes, no? Yes, okay, great. Um, so, uh, uh, for me, um, the writing is a form of thinking. I write to think. Some people think to write, I write to think. Um, it is a mechanism for me to lay down on a page and organize by laying down on the page some ideas about who we are, um, some ideas about where we're going, um, and perhaps the illuminating thing that we've discovered actually, virtually all physician writers have discovered is that in fact medicine allows you to do this in a way that virtually no profession does, uh, no other kind of calling does. Um, the intimacy that you can share with, um, the intimacy that you can share with what it means to be a human being today, now, um, that intimacy uh, is extraordinarily revealed my medicine. Not ordinarily revealed, but extraordinarily revealed my medicine. And we've, in becoming writers, we're really sort of exercising, all of us, from Oliver, who passed away, as you know, last year, um, certainly me, uh, Atul, Gawande, Paul Kalanithi, who also sadly, as you very well know, passed away. Uh, we're all trying to explore the same kind of questions that any writers are trying to explore, I think, um, questions about um, who we are, what is it like to be, to have a particular intimacy with, with dying, what is it like to live, what does it feel like, um, what does it mean, what does it feel like to heal, uh, what, what it, does it feel like when you fail to heal, uh, what is it like when you encounter some wonderful, wondrous thing about nature. Um, what if, what are the limits of knowledge like? Uh, what are the, why we fail in knowledge? What are the lacuna in human knowledge? What are the consequences of losing sight? Um, what does it feel like to have wisdom? 
and what does it feel like to fail in having wisdom? So what's interesting is these questions are, of course, fundamental. You know, they're fundamental there. I mean, obviously, the, the physician writer of all physician writers, Chekhov, um, began with these questions. Um, and he became a novelist. It turns out that the richness of medicine allows us to ask all of these questions all the time. Uh, and that's, that's my process, really. Dr. Mukherjee, perhaps every generation sort of feels that they're at the cusp of something really big and, you know, this is finally going to be the moment when sci-fi films and novels and everything will come true. But is there something special about today's times and our times with AI, with genetics, with a whole range of things happening that we are actually at that moment where it'll probably never be the same again? Well, so I think I'll tell you what, what the special features for this generation are. Um, and I'll tell you, I mean, whether they become, you know, whether this generation draws a strong line in the sand or doesn't is not relevant to me. What I'll tell you what the special features are, because they are indeed quite special. One is that um, over the last four or five years, we've acquired technologies um, to change and interrogate, not just change, but to interrogate the human genome with a kind of facility that we didn't have before. Um, in other words, there are two things that are coming out of this. Um, one thing is that um, we were struggling, as you very well know, um, we were struggling in medicine, in biology, in the sciences to explain the nature of human variation. Why do you look different from, uh, from me? Why is your biological fate, your medical fate, different from mine? Why does a young woman have breast cancer, another young woman does not. Why does my child suffer from one illness, another child does not? Um, we knew that there were genetic components. They're not the only components. We knew there were powerful genetic components to this. But we didn't know what those components were. Um, we now are beginning to know those components. And often they might have not one gene, but may have 100, may have 200. And our computational power, our knowledge, our power of knowledge was at its, at its very limit, but we seem to have now crossed into a new arena of limits. I call this reading, the process of reading. Um, it's uh, simultaneously uh, exhilarating, but very dangerous, and I've written about its dangers. Um, I will come to that in a second. Um, there's a paper published about a month ago which uses AI, I'll talk about AI in a second, but uses AI and genetics to predict human height. Um, this was unpredictable before. We, had, we knew that height was highly heritable, that in fact uh, we knew that obviously tall parents tend to produce tall children, shorter parents tend to produce short children. This has been observed since time immemorial. But there was no algorithm that would allow us to predict the height of a child or a person based on genetic information alone. I should say this, this only applies when you lift away environmental constraints such as nutrition. So in, I should say that in nutrition replete societies, there was no algorithm that would predict human height. This paper basically, as of the last uh, six to eight weeks, predicts human height based on genetic information alone to about half a centimeter. So you could say, well, do we really care about this? Absolutely we care, because you could now predict, as an academic exercise, you could predict your unborn child's height. And you could say, well, do we care about that? Absolutely we care, because the next step is you could predict your unborn child's features. You could predict your unborn child's hair color, and slowly you begin to edge into territory that's morally quite dangerous. Um, you could predict their future risk of illness. You could predict their future risk of having a neurodegenerative disease. You could predict the future risk of them having autism. These are all heritable illnesses, moderate to marginally heritable. Uh, and there seems to be no limit. As long as the features are heritable, we seem to have, be able to capture that information using genetics and computational technologies, including AI. That's reading. Writing takes a deeper step into the, into the, what I call the exhilarating abyss of human biology. 
Writing means that we also have the capacity to begin to change the information. You can now, again, based on technologies discovered about five to six years ago, which we're using a lot in our own laboratories, we're doing this actually daily, um, we're changing human genetic information. Um, we can change now on, really on demand, I should say. We can change on demand. I think it's not an exaggeration to say virtually any gene of choice uh, in the human, and we can probably change it in a human embryo. Uh, probably more than one, um, any gene of choice. We can certainly delete uh, genes. You can inactivate a gene like BRCA1, which will, in a human embryo or a, or a, or a sperm producing cell or an egg producing cell, you can s almost certainly delete uh, a gene that might predispose you to breast cancer. By the end of next year, we will begin to know how easy or difficult it is to replace them. Deleting is not a problem. Replacing it completely with a new information is, is a threshold. We're about to cross that threshold. You can decide whether that's a line in the sand or not. I think it is. Um, so that's writing, reading, writing. And the third piece you referred to is AI. You know, AI, was, AI is a complex field. I've written about it recently, quite extensively. I wrote a big piece in The New Yorker about it. It's been widely um, circulated, quite quoted. I have some strong reservations about it. Um, but as far as AI is concerned, um, just to give you very quickly what, what the field refers to, what it means. So in AI, um, we are uh, using, we're learning to use, algorithms in computers that s simulate or are similar to the nature of human learning. Now, how does a child learn to recognize or discriminate between a dog, a wolf, and a cat? Importantly, you don't give a child a rule book. You don't say, this is the rules of dog, this is the rules of cat, this is the rules of wolf. Right? That's not how a child learns. A child learns through an experiential process in which they're exposed to these three categories. And they learn to bin animals based on some features into category of dog, wolf, and cat. Um, they make mistakes, you correct them. And this process iterates over and over again. And through the iterative process of, of feature recognition, Learning algorithms in our brain, we think this, we don't know this, learning algorithms in our brain begin to attach what you might describe as connection weights, weights and connections. If the snout is this long, it should be a, in the dog and wolf category versus the cat category. If the ears are this long and if it's combined with some other features. So children basically then extract from images features and they use these features to build a kind of neural map, a neural network, and they organize this information, not based on a rule book, as I said, they don't tell you rules for dog and cat. In fact, if you query the child again, and say, well, what are the rules that define dog versus cat? They often can't tell you. They can't say, here are the rules. Snout has to be 117 centimeters, ears have to be blah, blah, blah. The child won't be able to tell you, but that child knows exactly how to bin dogs, cats versus wolves. Now, imagine building a computational architecture which captures knowledge in this manner. Our old computational architectures were based on rule book kind of learning. We would tell computers, here are a set of rules, and computers were very good at it. They could organize sets of rules, and if you gave them rules, if you gave them a kind of if-then-else statement, if it has ears, and it has hair, and this happens. It must be a dog. If it's this color, it must be that, blah, 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 blah. But in, in, with deep learning and with neural networks, you don't supply the rules. You supply experiences. You supply a mechanism for the machine to acquire its own knowledge structure. Um, and over time, just like a child learns, we think, the machine learns in the same way. Now, the interesting thing about it is that just like a child learns and then begins to use that information in powerful ways, you can present it with complex problems, the child, and the child can now start solving the complex problems just based on its heuristic or experiential learning. The machine can do that too. So to give you an example, coming back to the height, human height problem, 
um, the machine was really fed, well, all that really was fed into the machine was the genetic information of 500,000 or 700,000 individuals and what their actual heights were. And the machine figured out, really by itself, in a process that's opaque to us, the machine figured out how to correlate a particular genetic combination with the height. Now you can imagine what else we could do with this. It could figure, a machine could figure out, for instance, whether you're related or unrelated to another human being. Just like a child can figure it out. But now you begin to, you, now you begin to talk about the exhilarating abyss. On one hand, you can do powerful things. For instance, predict a woman's risk of breast cancer, man's risk of prostate cancer, potentially treat them before they have the cancer. These are powerful, wonderful things to have. On the other hand, you could do things that are that edge towards um, morally, ethically complex territory. You could ask machines to figure out by themselves uh, how to profile human beings. Uh, you could ask them to figure out uh, things that we're uncomfortable with, uh, classify us, classify faces, um, search the web and find information about ourselves which we're not willing to disclose otherwise. Uh, search our searches and figure out things psychometrically about us that we're not willing to disclose otherwise, which, we ha which happened recently, as you very well know in the news. Search this room as we sit and figure out in its, with its own metrics who the wealthy are and who the non-wealthy are and target something to the wealthy versus the non-wealthy and so forth. I can keep giving you examples that are more and more and more, uh, make us more and more and more deeply uncomfortable. So if I were to identify three technologies, um, drive cars, um, if I were to identify three technologies or two technologies, two arenas where we're drawing strong la lines in the sand about what human future looks like, it would be reading and writing genes, and it would be artificial intelligence. And just to finish up, it's the combination of these two things. It's when computers begin to read us, when we, rather than becoming the supervisors, become the subjects of our robot overlords, when we become the subjects, that's when, I suspect, for all of us, that's when our level of discomfort rises. And let it be clear, we are already the subjects. This line has already been crossed. We saw it recently politically in the, in the news that's been circulating. Everyone knows about Cambridge Analytica. That is the first step of using humans as subjects of deep learning. Let me emphasize again, we could see how powerful this could be in medicine. Uh, we are now, actually our laboratory in collaboration with uh, other laboratories is building a way to survey prostate cancers using just computational technologies alone. So I'll give you an example. Uh, in cancer, um, we get biopsies. We read the biopsies and we say, uh, you know, this looks, obviously this is cancerous, but this looks like a less aggressive cancer. We could read another biopsy and says, you know, say, you know, this is still a cancer. This looks like a very aggressive cancer. Obviously, we'll treat a man or a woman with the aggressive cancer differently and the man with the woman with the indolent cancer differently. But we don't do very well. We don't do very well. Our capacity is still quite limited. What if we, be, what if we allowed, what if we fused our brains with our computational technologies and it would allow us to discriminate between the aggressive and the non-aggressive cancers in a much more powerful way, we would be able, to, our sophistication in able to, being able to treat men and women, children with cancer would be vastly increased. This is what we're trying to do. Um, imagine, um, I often give the example of this, a pathologist who typically reads your specimens. When you train a young pathologist, a, man, a young man or woman, and you're training in pathology, she begins with a case study of zero, right? The first case that she reads moves her from case study of zero to case study of one. A computer, an algorithm, when it reads, begins with a case study of 500 million, 
right? Because you fed already. And the next case is 5 million and 1. So if you had to pit the skills of one versus the other, you can imagine which one I would choose. We aren't there yet, but we are feeding as we speak. Actually, while we do this in, uh, in Seattle, we are feeding about 1,000 specimens into, into algorithms to see. So they'll, they'll start with 1,000. It'll go to 10,000. It'll go to a million. And then we'll see. We all believe, I think, thoughtful people working in the field believe that these, that human intelligence allows us to do things that these computational technologies just, just don't have. We can, we identify, until now, we identify exceptions better than we identify rules. Humans are very good at identifying exceptions. Uh, humans can push red buttons when computers cannot push red buttons, we think. Um, but it's hard to know. Things might change in the near future. Just, just a very quick one before Parumita takes forward. I scared the forward. bejesus out of everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Is, you know, you said that you're already, we're already reading and doing the writing as well, right? And you're in a position to do that. Uh, are we in a position to change things for a set individual or have you reached the point where you can do it when the information will be transmitted across generations too? So can we edit away some things completely? Um, yeah, so that's an important distinction. It's a bright line distinction. So there are two kinds, uh, I would say, if you're talking about genetic changes, genetic engineering, there are three arenas that need to be distinguished. And it's important to think about the three arenas separately. Obviously, technology moves between them, but there are three arenas. And every time someone talks about genetic technologies engineering, we should divide it up into three arenas. So the first arena, which I'll call uh, uh, somewhat jokingly, I'll call all other species. Yeah, the rest of them. The rest of them. Um, that's a little bit like saying that, you know, the world is divided into cows and non-cows. But, um, but... That's a dangerous thing to say here. That's right, exactly. Well, that's why I said it. But, uh, um, but, uh, um, but this, there is the whole arena of all other species. The reason I'm saying this is that um, there, our interventions have already started. And they are, the, in, 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 in those species, the attempt is to change the species in a way that's permanent and that's transmittable. So for instance, this month or next month uh, in Florida, we will start doing genetic engineering on mosquitoes. Um, and before you throw up your hands in alarm, remember that mosquito-borne illnesses are devastating to human populations, malaria, dengue, uh, West Nile virus, chikungunya, hor horrible things. I'm told that the I'm told that the mosquito is the one animal or insect that has no purpose aside from being a human pest. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know how we would know, but <laughs> I don't know how we would know. All of a sudden, you know, there's a famous butterfly effect. You know, you, dis you make the mosquitoes disappear and in three generations, gone. we're gone as well. But, um, but we're certainly going to change mosquitoes and those will be released into the wild. In fact, they're being released probably in the next month or so. Uh, in the wild in Florida. They're contained in an island, uh, but that's happening. So by all other species, I mean mosquitoes, I mean crops, I mean fish. All these species are open for potential genetic engineering with, uh, uh, in, 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 in large part. Many technologies have to be breached, but the fundamental problems are tractable. They're not solvable immediately, but the fundamental problems lie within tractable reach. The main dangers, of course, in doing that are ecological. So the main dangers are biohazard. And the main concern there is human humility. We should be humble about our knowledge or lack of knowledge of, of the ecosystem. We want to make changes in the ecological world for good reason, I suspect. Uh, we could go horribly wrong, so we have to have some mechanisms to tell us, to remind us uh, how to keep those uh, practices safe. We could choose not to do it at all, by the way. Um, that's all other species. Um, the second category is what has been called, I'll throw out a technical word, but it's should, you should know it and then talk about the word. So it is somatic gene therapy. Soma, somatic refers to the body, if, refers to the human body. So here we are making, trying to make genetic changes in cells which are not permanently move to a next generation. 
So let's say you change an individual, someone has a blood disease, a genetic disease in the blood, sickle cell anemia, beta thalassemia, and or other organs, Tay-Sachs disease, cystic fibrosis, etc., Huntington's disease. Um, here the changes are made in cells. There are some limitations of technology. Sometimes you have to find a way to do it in many cells. Uh, but fundamentally speaking, these changes are not transmitted to the next generation. The danger there, the main danger there are the, some technological limitations, but the main danger there is uh, what I would call biological hazard or unintended consequences. What if in doing so you create a cancer, uh, create a leukemia, create in blood, create a different kind of cancer in, in so far, actually, that has not been the case with these new technologies. It's actually been shockingly safe from the standpoint of having an unintended effect on the genome. What happens down the road, we don't know, because these have just been one year. We're just about two, three years into human, uh, into human beings. Um, the third arena is obviously the most complicated, and that is, so all other species, somatic engineering, the third one's called germline engineering. And here, you are changing not just any cell in the body, but cells that make sperm, cells that make eggs, or embryos uh, themselves. And here, the bright line distinction is whatever change you make will be transmitted across multiple generations. Um, the technological barriers are high, uh, but solvable. The Hazards are obviously the biohazards, but now there are strong moral hazards. Uh, should we be playing with our own genomes? Uh, we certainly haven't done it in the past. Uh, should we have some humility in the face of the capacity to change our genetic information? Could we have a profound effect on ourselves as a species? Is this the way we self-determine our future um, should be stopped now. Um, so an international committee, there will be not one, but there will be several, probably dozens of international committees that will meet. Um, but the first international committee met, or one of the first international committees met in about April last year. Coincidentally, actually, I didn't even know this, but it was coincident with the gene coming out as a book. Um, and coincidentally, very much in line with what I had proposed in the gene, um, they, and surprisingly, this committee said that in fact the first human experiments with this kind of genetic change would be permissible. Um, so, at least off the gate, as it were, we, are, we have just opened that door. Uh, we have said that if there is a disease which involves extraordinary human suffering. That word is very important, extraordinary human suffering. If there is a disease that involves truly extraordinary human suffering, that we should be allowed as human beings, as scientists, as people who think, we should be allowed to tamper with the genetic information in a permanent way to erase the propensity for the disease. I had proposed a couple of them. I'll encourage you to read what I wrote in, in the gene. It's also been published as articles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I had proposed that we should have a couple more criteria, um, not just extraordinary suffering, but at least a criteria that this be done in societies where there is no moral coercion, um, that this should be done in societies where we have some uh, deep idea that individual freedoms exist and there is no state mandate to do this. Um, that is obviously a slippery criteria there. You can imagine that, you know, you can ask yourself, do you live in a coercive society? I don't know, maybe you do. Uh, your, your own feelings about what coercion is, what mandates are, may not be written on in law, but may be acting through passive social connections. Um, we've seen that happen in other countries. Um, and the danger, actually, uh, I would encourage you to read this section in the gene. I'd also encourage, if you're deeply interested, I would encourage you to go read the report. It's available online. It's called the Institute of, Institute of Medicine Report on Human Genetic or Genomic Engineering. It's available online. It's a long document. If you're dyingly interested, you should read the last three or four pages of it. Um, 
But in the last three or four pages, the authors, there was a list of about 50 authors. I'm involved with a new one of the new ones that, are, that is coming out. Um, about 50 odd authors uh, wrote as the first document, they said that, um, that they have real concerns about uh, human humility. As I said before, they have real concerns about our humility and that they have real concerns about uh, creating a culture where we extinguish diversity in the name of progress. Um, that they have very strong concerns about this. Um, particularly in societies where either there's a state mandate to bear a certain kind of child or, very important in the Indian context, or there is a personal mandate or a societal mandate which is passive. No one talks about it, it isn't in law, but we live in a country, as you know very well, where already a grotesque eugenics project has occurred. And I'm talking about female infanticide or female neglect. Um, in, if you leave this auditorium and travel a few hundred miles from here, you could be in a place where there are 750 women to 1,000 men. Profoundly abnormal human ratio. It has never been in human history that we have created societies where there are 800 women to 1,000 men. It's something to be ashamed of. Um, it is something to be conscious of. But let it be said that you don't require, at least in this one, in this case, you did not require a state mandate to drive a human population across three, four, five generations into a, into a pathologically abnormal state. There was no state mandate. In fact, there were state mandates to not do this. Um, so uh, I not only echo the concerns um, that the report had, I would say in the context of countries where there are passive mandates, uh, I, would, I find them extremely disturbing. No, I'm going to take a step back here and ask you something. With all the progress that is being made in modern medicine, do you feel that as a society we are becoming averse to the idea of accepting death as the logical end? Um, you know, I think that's, uh, you know, this has been debated a lot. Um, I think um, certainly a, a series of physician writers, including me, but uh, Atul Gawande famously, most recently, Oliver, Paul, uh, Kalanithi, um, have uh, tried to remind us to keep a certain sense of moral balance, personal balance between understanding the uh, progress, uh, medical progress that's been made and balancing it against things like dignity around death. Um, in fact, what's interesting about it is that um, in, a, in, in, in the United States is um, often caricatured as a country where people are unable to accept death. In fact, uh, the uh, use of hospice in the United States has increased. Um, our understanding of palliative care has actually deepened uh, among the uh, young and the elderly in the United States. So I think imagining societies where progress in medicine is portrayed in an adversarial relationship with dying with dignity um, is certainly possible. We know such societies exist. We can, we've certainly seen them. But it's also possible, I think, to imagine societies where progress within medicine is not in an adversarial relationship with dying. Uh, that, in fact, these two things can uh, coexist. Um, and we'd like that to be India. I think we'd like that to be this country. We would like this country, like many others, to have a non-adversarial relationship with medical progress, accepting its ideas, accepting what can be done, accepting the capacity to relieve extraordinary suffering, but on the other hand, also allowing enough space for people, young and old, to have dignity around dying. I think that's possible to do. It's harder to do. It's the adversarial relationship is easier to come by. You know, I'm trying to live, don't, don't force me to die. That adversarial relationship is easier to come by. You can imagine it more easily. But there are certainly attempts, and I would say successful attempts, 
to have to hold both the ideas at the same time. We're trying to do, I'm an oncologist. Uh, it's something I try to achieve. It's not always possible to achieve. In your own head, the, uh, the, the two angels battle each other um, constantly. Um, but I suspect for individuals, when, when those two angels have finished their mutual battle, you can often find a resolution for an individual. You mentioned, I mean, you know, oncology is, you're an oncologist, Dr. Mukherjee, and your first book, which really kind of touched a chord, and you, you did a biography of the C word. I mean, people were, who were so hesitant to even talk about cancer. It was touching more lives than it ever did or that we were aware of. And you said something very interesting, that cancer is probably very different from several other diseases in the way that it kind of is a shadow of our evolutionary path or, or you know, the human body itself. So would you just take us a bit through that thought about what makes cancer so um, difficult and at the same time so interesting to grapple with as an oncologist or as a doctor? Well, this has to do with, this, with, has to do with the idea that um, more than really any other disease, this could be true for other diseases, more than any other disease, um, the fundamental mechanism of cancer builds on vulnerabilities in, of our physiology as humans, which are fundamental to being human. In other words, the very processes, the very genes that allow us to become who we are, uh, to grow, to repair our wounds, to heal ourselves after we're injured, corruptions of those very genes allow us also or enable cancerous growth. Um, this is a very important idea to drive home. It's, of course, on one hand, a biological idea. Of course, it has philosophical and metaphorical consequences. But the consequences are very clear. It is that there is no free lunch in the human genome. That, in fact, there are trade-offs. And the trade-offs between growth, the natural trade-off of growth, is one natural trade-off of growth, metabolism, our capacity to be multicellular, all the th things that make us who we are, um, our capacity to resist the depredations of the environment of injury, if you just flip them over as if it were a card, um, inevitably uh, lead to cancerous growth. Um, and its consequences are felt across, have already been felt in the West. Um, for certain populations, they are being felt in India. There is no doubt in my mind that cancer will reach what you might consider epidemic proportions in India um, because of cancer appears in the double negative. It appears when other diseases, such as infectious diseases, vanish um, in the United States as we've made uh, important milestone or landmark conquests against other diseases up came cancer. Um, and there is absolutely no doubt, we can already see it, we can, there's absolutely no doubt that this will happen in many countries around the world. Uh, you might be surprised to know, for instance, that um, in places like, um, I know this data for Tanzania, um, where you would imagine that the most, that the biggest killers were infectious diseases, those curves are rapidly shifting. The biggest killers are becoming hypertension, cancer, uh, heart disease, diabetes, dementia, uh, all these illnesses that, you know, we didn't grow up really thinking about perhaps, but have become very much, much part of our lives. I would wager to say that in your parents' generation, in our parents' generations, um, it still was the C word. In our generation, people who are sitting in this audience, I will guarantee it that you know someone in your immediate one step away who has been touched or killed by cancer. Um, this is the new epidemiology of what is happening in all parts of the world. India has the third highest number of cancer patients among women after um, China and US. Are women more susceptible to cancer? No, that's not true. So, um, you know, if you look at uh, uh, susceptibility numbers, um, 
they range, it, 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 there's a wide range of susceptibility numbers. Um, but for women and men, you know, the incidence of cancer, just how often you get cancer, how often cancer rises, ranges in the United States between one in three, one in two. And there, it really depends on the subtype or, the, or the, really the subtype. Um, it, the epidemiology is quite different. In women, it's driven really by breast cancer and other cancers that are common to men. In men, it's driven by many other cancers, including prostate and lung. Um, but there's a wide shared connection. So cancers of head and neck, colon, rectum, et cetera, et cetera, are obviously uh, common to both. Um, but I would say overall, I mean, there are certain epidemiological differences. Maybe there are obviously certain risks. I mean, prostate cancer is a male disease. Breast cancer is mainly, for the most part, a female disease. Men also get breast cancer rarely. Um, but the numbers are not so out of comparison that, that you have specific uh, susceptibilities. Uh, does it concern you, Dr. Mukherjee, when you come back to India, given uh, our levels and uh, state of public health? That Please should call be... me Siddharth. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Please call yeah, me Siddharth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what we can expect with cancer kind of getting to the proportions that you've outlined it may get to. Uh, we hear about the NHS being able to cope with some degree of success with this and you know other systems, maybe Cuba, I, 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 I don't know about the, you know more about the, tell us more about the US, but what worries you more about say, uh, perhaps the near absence of public health policies uh, or processes in India to cope with this? Well, the, the range, again, if you think about cancer, you have to think about it in different categories or buckets. And if you fail to do that, you can get very confused. And really, the importance is to not get confused. So the, the cancer begins with prevention, cancer prevention. That's the mainstay of cancer therapy. Um, and the mainstay there is um, that is a that is a powerfully, that is driven by public health. Um, and virtually all successful attempts at cancer prevention have been attempts by governments. These, this, is, this is far from a privatized enterprise. It has to have certainly NGOs and advocacy groups can help, but the real uh, onus falls on governments. So in, the, in India and other places, um, cancer prevention begins with limiting carcinogens. Tobacco is the main one, mainstay of them, rampant in India, um, very poorly controlled. Um, and we know from a, a whole load of epidemiological data that it can be controlled. There's nothing endemic about tobacco control. You can actually do it. Uh, large nations have been successful in doing it. The effect on human populations has been vast. So, so, but it has to be done. It has to be political will to do it, um, which is clearly lacking so far here. So um, attempts have been made, but they have to be really capitalized. Um, other examples of cancer prevention include some degree of success in vaccination. Um, there are viral cancers of which human papilloma virus is probably the largest, uh, most common, uh, that we can vaccinate against. Um, uh, and as you know very well, uh, despite many efforts, uh, vaccination for women against human papilloma virus in this country, efforts have stalled. Um, I think that's a, that's a shame um, because this, uh, the deaths from cervical cancer uh, I mean, I treated many, many women with cervical cancer. Those are many preventable deaths. Um, sh it's a real embarrassment. Um, and the rejection of science, medical science, is a real embarrassment. You know, science is not fake news. Uh, it is real news for people. Um, the rejection of, of this based on um, rather flimsy criteria, I would say, um, is a real embarrassment. Um, and I hope that this gets redressed and turned around. No vaccination is going to be without some degree of, of collateral effects. Uh, that doesn't exist for any vaccination. Um, but most vaccines for the, last, for the large part are safe. Um, and in this case, they have the capacity to prevent disease. So I think that would be one example. So there's the bucket of prevention. The onus generally falls on public enterprise. Um, the second arena, which is really tends to be a public private collaboration, as it were, um, is in early detection of cancer, so-called secondary prevention, or primary prevention, uh, sorry, secondary prevention, in which you try to detect cancer early. Um, 
we have not been phenomenally successful at doing this. Mammograms are helpful, but they don't really have an, a massive impact. That's not to say that you shouldn't be getting mammograms. It just is to remind us that those technologies have fundamental limitations. We're trying to get better. In fact, the AI genomics examples I told you are trying to use that information to find out who's likely to be benefit from a mammogram, who's, where we'll be likely to find the most uh, dangerous cancers, et cetera. Um, we don't do very much of this at all in India. Um, it's actually quite, uh, we're quite, quite further behind. Um, even nations like Cuba, um, where there's a lot of um, early detection has actually taken off quite, quite well. The third branch of the third bucket is treatment. This is a narrow, it's a funneling system. Of course, we want to treat the fewest, prevent the most. Um, and here, of course, it is without saying that we, we really lack the infrastructure. We don't train oncologists. I don't know how many oncologists we train. What's the number? How many oncologists are we training in India per year? Sanjay, how many oncologists are we training in India per year? Hundreds, uh, 200, 300 cancer doctors, uh, where the need is on the order of um, several thousand, um, actually. So um, there are some, so all of this are capacity to uh, give therapy, appropriate therapy for cancer is limited by all of this. Um, and again, people say, gosh, you know, how can we train people in this medical field? It's too expensive. Just to remind you, tamoxifen um, is available at, uh, really at a price which makes it just as affordable as an infectious, uh, as an anti-infective agent, as an antibiotic. And its effect on uh, breast cancer can be transformative. Tamoxifen is a cheap drug. Uh, not every drug is, not every cancer drug is, not every kind of cancer therapy is, but tamoxifen is. Palliative care for cancer, forget about treatment. Um, morphine is a cheap drug, um, but you can barely get it in India. When my father passed away last year in October, I went from doorstop to doorstop, from pharmacy to pharmacy, trying to relieve his pain with morphine. I could not find, I, can, I could go to the United States. It would take me all of 15 minutes to myself write a prescription for an opioid, fentanyl, morphine, et cetera. It would take, have taken me 15 minutes to relieve his pain as he lay dying. It, I went from doorstep to doorstep with a prescription. Um, I couldn't find pain relief to save his life. They said, you know, give him Tylenol and ibuprofen. So that's, that's a problem. We need to solve that problem. We've approached, actually, we've approached um, through several sectors, through several ways, we approached the Prime Minister about this. If we want to have a proper um, portfolio of ways to treat cancer, we absolutely need chemotherapeutic drugs, we need infusion centers, we need ways to give patients the medicines, but we equally and absolutely need real palliative care, and we cannot get real palliative care without opioids. It is a disservice to human beings. Uh, head and neck cancer, you know, invading their teeth, um, breast cancer that's advanced with metastases, you just cannot, you know, these medicines are cheap, these are, have been available for decades. Yes, is there a risk of a, you know, addictive uh, problems? Yes, absolutely. Um, have those risks been serious? Yes, absolutely. In the United States, they have been serious. In other countries of the world, but but the but the NHS, just to give you one example, other countries, coming back to Cuba, have done perfectly well treating uh, pain, severe pain not just cancer related. In my father's case, it was related to his decline and dementia. It doesn't have to be cancer related, but end of life care uh, requires morphine um, and its analogs. And giving end of life care in 2018 without morphine is an embarrassment. So we'll write, we'll try again. We'll write to the prime minister again. We have, uh, and when I say we, I have done this myself. Um, uh, I will try again, uh, reminding ourselves that there are dangers. This is not a this is not a free for all, but there are several nations that have managed to do this without falling into the trap of 
releasing addictive substances among generally young people who don't, should not have access to those addictive substances, clearly dangerous, but there are several nations that have threaded that needle successfully and really, I mean, in 2018, we should not be treating the elderly in palliative methods with ibuprofen. No, one of the things that you uh, said, Siddharth, was uh, very interesting, that it's time to not take science as fake news. You know, it's not fake news. We've had a series of kind of events in India as well, S you know, statements by people in power, people who are responsible for science and technology policy, who, you know, they've contested Darwin in the most incredible of ways. I mean, I'm sure there's a case for doing that, but it's happened kind of very on the fly. Uh, in, in the US as well, there seems to be, you know, I mean, science as fake news seems to have a new lease of life. So so what do you do when people who are in policy, who are in positions of power, are almost uh, taking a completely different position from what they should be to the science establishment? And then you have all these changes happening. And as you said, we're at the cusp of very fundamental change with the coming together of many technologies. So what's the way? I, mean, I don't know. You tear your hair out and you scream at them. I mean, what, what are you supposed to do? Um, you use, uh, you hope to use reasoned dialogue to remind people that there is a that this is a uh, long conversation. Um, it is a conversation that has been going on in human history for now, all known human history. Uh, the capacity to use reason um, for human emancipation, but the capacity to use reason to interrogate nature, to understand nature has been going on for a long time and that we won't let them interrupt this conversation and deviate this conversation. It's not fair to us as humans. Of course, there are all sorts of problems. We know that unleashed in the wrong direction, there have been excesses. It's important to acknowledge those excesses and not swipe them under the carpet. Um, it's important to talk about them. It's important to learn the lessons from them. Um, in fact, one way that both, the, both my books can be read are, is to remind ourselves about what, the, what those excesses were and could have been. We've seen them in cancer, we've seen them in eugenics. I'd encourage people to read the chapter on eugenics and, remi and remind ourselves that these impulses are very fundamental. Their impulses are in fact present in virtually every country, certainly present in India. Um, uh, so, uh, so on one hand, to remind people that this, these are important to air, to understand, uh, but on the other hand, also not allow uh, people to deviate or to uh, uh, take over a conversation that has gone on in humans uninterrupted. Um, that's one of the wonderful things about um, the natural sciences is that when you use the term force, you are using the term force in exactly the same way that New Newton used the term force 400 years ago when you use the term volume, when you use the term cancer, we are trying, may not be true for cancer, but we're trying to use the term exactly the same way that someone used it 300 years ago. Name one word or name a few words outside the context of science where you know that you're using the word today in exactly the same way that someone used it 300 years ago. There are few such words in the English language, and that tells you that when the conversation is successful, you can talk to someone who's been dead for 400 years, as if they were sitting in the room. You could have a conversation with Newton. You could say, I'm going to use the word force, and you will understand exactly what I mean. And therefore, I can con converse with you across 400, six, when I use the word triangle, you and I will have no debate about, and I can talk to Pythagoras. What other discipline allows you to do this? So it is important not to interrupt this conversation. It is a powerful conversation. It has errors. It's important to acknowledge the errors. But it's probably the most beautiful conversation we've ever had across multiple generations. That's not to say that, they're all, that, the, um, that when words change meaning, they can also be quite beautiful. They're different. So essentially, faith and science can coincide. You've written about Mendel, whose uh, spiritual quest did not hamper his scientific 
inquiry? Well, in, the, in Mendel's case, they coincided. It's not clear to me that they can coincide today, actually. <laughs> I'm afraid that's yeah. not clear. It's becoming less and less clear. Depends on what faith you have, by the way. What about you? You know, um, I, I've become, I mean, personally speaking, I've been agnostic for a while. I've become progressively more agnostic. Um, I, I have an interest in helping people. Um, I'm an interest in, um, and um, personally speaking, I'm interested in small metaphysical questions. I'm not interested in large metaphysical questions. Okay, I'm a fellow agnostic, but you know, isn't that a cop out? Yeah, it's a cop out. You know, what what am I supposed to say? I mean, what's the, what's the what's the opposite of a cop out here? <laughs> That's well, very agnostic. <laughs> you can't do that. Yeah. What's the what, well, well describe to me what the opposite of a cop out would be? Um, I don't know what the opposite of cop out is. We opt is, into something, you know. Say again. We, uh, we kind of opt into something. We, we either disbelieve with ferocity or we believe. Uh, why do you have to opt into something? It's not clear to me. Yeah. Okay. No, I won't contest you on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you can. <laughs> no, no, I don't want to know. <laughs> I am an agnostic after all. No, uh, there's a wonderful article you tweeted, I think it was this month, where I, I think you kind of spoke also about the article uh, which you wrote uh, about your father's last uh, few days and you described uh, the, some of the morphine journey and the other things that you dealt with. This particular article talks about, of course, you know, in the quest of, you know, when you're in your laboratory and you're looking for the gene, there is this thing that we are looking for the gene for this and the gene for that. And uh, this describes the other side of, you know, I mean, it's, in a sense, it's that very typical and tiring debate, the, the nature versus nurture thing. But as you are, you know, in the laboratory and you're looking at this gene, where do you stand on that debate about how much this gene is going to actually be responsible for fixing something, giving it direction, and how they're going to be the other things. That I think it, it, it termed it the loop out, which is all about environment, learning, being schooled, etc. So, yeah, so you know, a lot of my new work, I should say, um, um, you know, obviously, like everyone, we're evolving as thinkers. Uh, a lot of the new work that I'm doing has a has a thematic element. You might not know it off the top of my head, but I know it. I often know it, as I said, after I finish writing. That's why I write, to figure out what I'm thinking. A lot of the new work, if you, if I, in fact, I thought about this when I was on my way here uh, on the flight, a lot of the new work fundamentally has to do with r placing things that we thought were powerfully, would powerfully determine features of ourselves, placing them back in context, placing them back in the context of ourselves. So to give you some examples, and I'll tell you how this fits in, uh, I've been thinking a lot about, in, in my own, actually, and, and you know, I, my laboratory then moves this way. Um, I've been thinking a lot about, well, we've spent so much time monomaniacally obsessed with genes that drive the growth of cancer cells. What about the cells that surround a cancer? that are not cancerous? What about the homes that cancers build around themselves? What about the environments, micro-environments? And then what about the macro-environments in which a human being exists, their cancer exists? Um, what about the, um, uh, so I wrote a big piece uh, called Cancers, in the Invasion Equation, which came out, was in the New Yorker, which uh, tries to turn away um, from this, as I said, monomaniacal obsession with the cell itself and tries to understand what a, how can we put the cell back into its, con into its micro environmental context. Um, and in doing so, I read work that I hadn't read before. I mean, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to think I'd read everything about all of this. Of course I hadn't. I read work by um, D.W. Smithers, a, an English oncologist from the, from the 19th. 30s, 40s, 50s, who wrote an incredible piece in which he said, um, in which he wrote, cancer is a disease of cells just as much a traffic jam as a disease of cars. Um, so you can imagine, it's a very powerful provocation. This was a time when everyone was obsessed with cells. And yes, a traffic jam is a disease of cars. That might be correct, but it's obviously not a disease of cars in the sense of in the sense of the car itself. It's about the context in which the car finds itself, right? Smithers got lacerated. Um, they were 
letters written and letters written in the Lancet to reply back to this, cancer is a disease of cells, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we're starting to understand that, that there's some truth to this idea. I'll give you one more example, a kind of puzzle that we've been thinking about for a long time. Breast cancer, we know, metastasizes to the liver occasionally. Cancers metastasize to the liver, virtually never metastasize to the spleen. They're the same shaped organ, same sized organ that live next to each other. Why not? What about one environment makes it very receptive, the other environment not? Breast cancer metastasizes to the bones but it virtually never metastasizes to your wrist or to your finger. No one's ever heard of breast cancer in your finger or in your wrist. Why not? Why does it metastasize to hips or spine or other bones? Why not other bones? So it's a whole series of thoughts. So this comes, brings me back to my, the, uh, the piece that I wrote about my father, which has also been widely circulated. And there, again, I was thinking about similar questions. Um, the question there is homeostasis. What does it mean? How do beings, organisms, how do, how do they maintain their sense of balance? How do they maintain senses of cells? How do they resist forces that change um, in the context of being themselves? How do we keep things the same? And again, it's, it goes against this idea of, oh, you know, we know the elements of change. We know the elements that will change a body. If you give this medicine, that will happen. Very deterministic way of thinking, also correct. But what about the flip side, what are the yang side of that, the yin yang side of that? What, if, what about the things that happen which resist these changes, these forces? And in fact, we're built that way. We're built so that we aren't sort of, we aren't blown away by a single environmental change. Our bodies, our physiologies, our cells, our cells are meant to resist. So again, this work, I think, is thematically organized. Um, I didn't know it myself, actually. When I started writing these pieces, I didn't know it myself. But in retrospect, in, in, there'll be a, a series of five of them. And they'll be collected, we're hoping, in a book. Meru, where are you? <laughs> um, uh, but nonetheless, we will find ways to organize these uh, thoughts about what I call the yang side of uh, determin deterministic thinking. Again, coming back to this larger question of how science is viewed, and particularly in India, it's really fascinating that there's a near obsession with, uh, you know, if people being science graduates and you know opting for science after class ten. You perhaps also saw a bit of that in when you were in school in India. Uh, but there is, you know, other than this, you know, bacha ya to doctor ya engineer banega. There is this uh, fascination with gadgets as well, and you know we like digital things, and you know, we don't like analog counters and all that. There is also a very touching disregard to you know, the spirit of inquiry and rationalism and reason otherwise. So how does this kind of get divorced from this, this love for technology, gadgets, and fruits of science, if you like, without the accompanying spirit? I mean, you is know, that I, just, I don't know. Society? I have no idea. Is that true? Do you find that true? In India, is that true? Is that a common trope uh, that you have a love for gadgetry but a disregard? I just don't know. Is it? Yeah, I, I that experienced that. I mean, I don't know if I took a vote here. I, mean, I, I don't you know. know exactly. People agree, you must yeah, be feeling I, it in some. Yeah, to some I do extent. think so. That yeah. there are people fascinated by technology, its its results, with science. But the other things that follow with science, the scientific temper, other things, are do not have the same values. Uh, is that right? Yeah. Values. So I, the, the 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 quick answer is I don't know. I have, I have some some humility about context here. Um, I, I I don't know. I I would imagine that. Uh, uh, first of all, um, I think it's a wonderful thing to train scientists. Um, I think it's a wonderful thing. I think um, edu I think it's a you know I think it's a wonderful thing to be. And um, uh, I think uh, I think of course there is a sense of balance that I think people want to achieve. Um, you want to be a, your physician, your doctor, not to be a technocrat, right? You don't want to be a, you don't want your doctor to be a, to be a gadget man or a gadget woman. Um, you want them to be a human being, and then, if they happen to like gadgets, that's fine. But they want to, want them to be human beings first. Um, but you know, I, I, I think, the, the, I think, I think, we should have no shame in 
training scientists and engineers. I think it's a great thing. Um, as long as you have, uh, um, I, as long as, as you're, what you're calling, it's a nice phrase, as long as the, the temperament, the scientific temperament remains uh, present. Um, but there's, you know, there's a kind of, um, and, and actually importantly, as long as, the, as long as the representation of genders in science remains adequate. Um, uh, those are important uh, caveats. Uh, but all of this said, you know, should we be ashamed that we, we are training young scientists and engineers? No, it's a great thing. Um, train more. So how did the sciences and the arts come together in your life? You, well, you know, I, I, again, I, it's not, I didn't consciously set out to be, I mean, I had, I didn't consciously set out to be a writer at any point of time. I like reading. Um, at some point of time, I realized in my own trajectory that I, I like reading more than anything else in the world. It's my favorite thing to do. There's nothing more I like to do than reading. Um, and so I thought, if that's the case, I might as well write something. Um, but at some point of time, you have some degree of self-realization that if I were left alone in a room for 200 years, and if I could read, I would be perfectly happy. Um, and so at, if, you, if that's where you're going, I think that, I mean, the question often asked is, well, how do you know you're a writer? How do you, what, what makes you a writer? I think you learn to write by reading. There's no other, I mean, this is the simplest equation of all. Um, uh, I, I, I like doing it. I think it's a wonderful thing to do. Um, and medicine, did you always want to be a doctor? Oh, did I always want to? You know, it sort of came to me slowly. Um, I, uh, uh, there's almost certainly some reinvention in your own brain about what you want it to be. No one really knows what they want to be, but do you retrofit it to what you've become if you're happy and you retrofit it to what you <laughs> could, have been. could have been if you're unhappy, right? So, then the, so you have to be a little bit careful about your own, <laughs> when someone asks you, you know, did you always want to be? <laughs> Right? It's really what they're, what they're asking you is, are you a happy human being or an unhappy human being? Right? So, that, so um, I think it dawned on me generally, just slowly. I wanted to be a scientist for a while. Um, I found it uh, exhilarating, but somewhat isolating. Um, and so I, I, I think, but I, but I suspect that there's some retrofitting going on in, in that idea. You're a trained uh, singer, right? Uh, oh, gosh, I mean, yes. do, do you still sing? Um, yes, I sing. Uh, you know, we have a, I have a band uh, uh, which is, uh, which sort of does, sits at the intersection of jazz and Indian classical music. I was trained. Um, actually, that's another thing I like to do. <laughs> uh, um, but I have, I, I, uh, you know, um, the, the answer is yes. Uh, the band is um, sometimes cacophonous. <laughs> As all bands should be. At What's the band band. called? Uh, so that's uh, it's called it Jog out. Blues. Oh. <laughs> After the Rag Jog. Ah, yeah. Rag Jog. Okay. But also joining. So. Okay. So. Paramita, if you don't have any question right away, we can just throw the floor open to our very eminent audience. So my colleagues here have microphones. So may I request you to please identify yourself before you ask a question. And please try and avoid asking deep, you know, questions which are very personal about um, a particular medical condition which may have affected. We may not be in a position to handle that kind of a question. So shall we start from here? Maybe that yeah. Renal? Yeah. Thank you. Please identify yourself, yes. Yeah, I'm uh, Ramanujam. I'm a <laughs> professor in Indira Gandhi National Open University. Uh, it was a fascinating interview. My question is, when you write to think more precisely and more clearly, dealing with the subject like cancer. How do you balance between your writing and the audience and the language you use? Yeah, I, th I mean, obviously, it's a, it's a tough uh, place uh, to think and write. I, I, um, actually, I prefer not to think of an audience. Uh, that's my personal preference. I prefer to think about writing for myself and to myself. If you're writing to think, that's helpful. Um, 
uh, it's also helpful because it immediately identifies things that you don't know. Um, you can tell, uh, just like you can tell uh, if you're a musician, you know when you've struck a false note before anyone knows it. Um, in the same sense, when you write, if you don't have the, if you lack the, the querying of yourself um, is the best guide. Um, so I don't think of audience, I try to think of myself as a reader. That's the first uh, way. The second thing is, um, I think that all good uh, writing, writing to thinking, writing to think, whether actually this is in fiction or non-fiction, I wrote a long piece recently saying that even within in the world of fiction, everyone is answering, trying to answer a question. Um, in fact, when I approach a piece of writing, when I approach a piece of art, um, I'm always, I always start with the following. I say, what question is this trying to solve or answer? It's a very unusual, perhaps, way, or perhaps it's usual, I don't know, but it's my way of anticipating virtually anything. So when I go and see a painting, when I go see a piece of sculpture, my wife's a sculptor, when I go and see um, work, the first thing that goes through my brain is, what question is this work trying to answer? So uh, it's an interesting exercise. Throw this out for yourself. What question is the god of small things trying to answer? There is a question. I guarantee it. There's a question that that book is trying to answer. What question is the suitable boy trying to answer? There's the answer is a question. There is a question. Um, what question is a whatever it is? And this is applied quite broadly to whatever element of art you're trying to uh, ask. So I always go back to that. What question is, is, is something trying to answer? And that helps me. Um, a historian is trying to answer a question. A novelist trying to answer a question. Obviously, nonfiction writers try to answer questions. Hi, I'm Deepika Mago. Wanted to know, uh, is there something in diet that can be uh, said that it is preventing cancer? Not right now. We're doing a whole bunch of studies. Um, in fact, one will be launched in the next. Well, we know some things. We know that there's a powerful connection between obesity and cancer. Um, we've known that for a while. But it's not clear whether the connection is because of diet or because of genetics. That's an often mistaken idea. We don't know whether the contributor that's connected is dietary or genetic or something else, could be some other category. So we know this for a long time. Um, we also know that, um, that there are uh, contributions of minor carcinogens, actually. So red meat is one of them. But its contribution is certainly present, but it doesn't add up to the real incidence of cancer. So, um, we are just about to launch in collaboration. Columbia and uh, Cornell and Harvard are just about to launch, really led by a Harvard group, uh, uh, the, one of the first uh, rather comprehensive studies, which will follow uh, men and women with diets prospectively across, we hope, tens of years. Um, and some of them are going to be on a ketogenic diet, which we think are, is interesting from the standpoint of cancer. We don't know yet. Um, and we'll also do a simultaneous study of, of this as a treatment. But it's early days. Uh, we'll know soon. No. Uh, Siddharth, my name is uh, Naseem Zaidi. And uh, very recently in my job in the Election Commission, I dealt with manifestos. Uh, you have detailed the history of uh, development of gene and genome in your recent book, The Gene, which I have read it. I have read all of your books, in fact. And uh, you have said there are three billion letters in the, in the, in the human genome, and only 20,000 have been discovered. So, so my, in that context, my question is, or my clarification that I want to learn from you is, what is going to be the what is going to be three or four top items of the manifesto of genome history or genetic research, say, in 50 years or 100 years? You know, politicians have been used to five years manifesto, but five years is no period in science. Right. So that is my clarification. Thank you very much. So 
Um, so it's an important, you know, what we're trying to do is, again, the, the aim of the project is to try to understand human similarity and difference um, and try to understand what, how much our DNA contributes to human similarity and how much it contributes to difference. And by difference, it can range from why is your uh, trivial questions, I think are generally uninteresting, but some people might find it interesting, why is your physiognomy, why is your face different from mine, why is your nose different from mine, why is your hair color different from mine, but, but of course, the rather profound questions, why do you have a disease and I don't? Um, why do you have a risk of a disease and I don't, et cetera? So those are, I think, substantial questions we're trying to answer. So the first thing is really in, in our process of trying to understand this, we're trying to understand how to make sense of human variation and similarity. Why are you made like me? Why are you unlike me? Why do you look like your parents? Why do you not resemble your parents? How can we explain the differences between you and me across time, across space, across geographic space, um, using our understanding of genes. And the second one, I think high on the manifesto is, if we had that information, should we, would we, could we, in that order, um, change this information, either using the various methods I've identified. So those would be high on the list, reading and writing. Yes, gentleman on the back. I said that I'm Ajay Gurevarta. I teach philosophy at JNU. Uh, I was wondering if you're familiar with uh, Michel Foucault's writings. <clears throat> Very familiar. And, and uh, how would you uh, rate your own writings? With that? Because it looks like you're trying to create a social narrative for medicine, while Foucault runs the other way around, actually to deny the pathological or the pathological as a, uh, as a social construct. I almost see you're at two ends of the spectrum. Would that be a right reading to make? Right. So, I, you know, I, I obviously have. Uh, dealt with and read uh, uh, Foucault's writing a lot. He comes in many times. In fact, he was very influential to the writing of the gene. Um, there might even be, there's certainly quotes from, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a section which actually deals very much with uh, Foucault's ideas about um, what would happen or what does happen when uh, we regularize or normalize human beings. This goes back to the point that the, actually the commission made, the IOM, the Institute of Medicine Commission made, about uh, seeking normalcy and the real concern of diminishing human diversity. That actually, that concern arises very much out of the strand of thought which was brought to us um, by people like, by philosophers like, uh, by Foucaultian philosophers, that the the desire to, uh, that, that, that the medical desire to normalize has to be kept in check versus the human desire to maintain and celebrate uh, that we are different from each other. I'm very inspired by that idea, I'm very concerned with that idea. You know, um, we come at it, as it were, through very different spaces. Um, I'm obviously primarily a doctor. Um, I do think that the different perspectives are important. Um, but we obviously share, I just gave you some examples of how I've been inspired by and I share many fundamental commonalities with um, a group of philosophers among whom uh, Foucault is one. Um, I would say philosophers, philosophers who've concerned themselves very deeply with uh, normality and difference. Um, and I share their concerns very much. My name is uh, Deepak Pentel. I teach genetics. Uh, I used to teach. I'm, and I work with GM crops. I want to compliment you for this wonderful book, The Gene. And I think every student of biology should read it because sometimes we teach biology in a very sectarian way from a very narrow perspective. And you have really caught up with a very large canvas uh, in your book. My question to you is a very basic one. You know, we, we know that mutation is, a deleterious mutation can cause cancer, a mutation can cause disabilities, but mutation is basically the raw material on which all the life has evolved. The point is that we are accumulating too many mutations because natural selection is not operating. The modern medicine is protecting people 
from purifying selection. So I believe that there is inevitability in at least corrective interventions. Otherwise, we will be all landing up in hospitals and the health budgets will soar so high that no country will be able to afford it. That may be the end of human. So some intervention is required. I would like to know what you think with all your readings. Well, I think before interventions are required, humility is required. Um, and I think we lack uh, that humility currently. Um, I think uh, one of the things that distinguishes us from animals is our capacity to care for the ill. Um, in fact, one of the points made in the book is that illness, even genetic illness, and perhaps particular genetic illness, is a mismatch between the environment and you. Um, uh, a hairless, a hairless man is ill in Antarctica, but very well in Africa. Um, just to give you one example, because it, it's the climactic, you know, how you adapt to the climactic changes. Um, it's important to realize that because it affords a certain degree of humility about what illness is. Um, now, there, you're absolutely right that there are certain, particularly genetic illnesses, where, you could, where the human mind is boggled about how those, but we can't create environments really within human reason to make those individuals flourish. I still think that our primary responsibility is to give them care. Uh, this is a human impulse. I think denying that impulse is to deny what is fundamental about ourselves. Um, and I, I would, I, I have generally, um, been an advocate of humility because our, our attempts to tamper with selection, if you haven't noticed, have gone quite badly um, uh, in history. So I think the first face of this, if we read history carefully, if you read genetic history carefully, should be humility. Um, rehabilitation, Victor McCusick, the greatest of the human geneticists, um, was extraordinarily concerned with what he called the genetic industrial complex not the military industrial complex, but the genetic industrial complex in which we would try to use, reuse forces of selection, natural selection to recraft the human genome to our specifications. And he, you could not find a deeper believer in genetics, but he was also, he, he founded the field of human genetics, but was also re reminded himself to be extraordinarily sympathetic and humble in the face of trying to shape the human genome. I would like to remind ourselves of that again in, in, as we move forward. So the first step should be humility. The first step should be to relieve extraordinary suffering. Uh, that's what I believe. Um, I believe that the, it's not clear to me that the forces of selection have been entirely removed. Uh, we're undergoing selection during our evolution. Um, I hope that we can um, try to eliminate diseases through genetic means, but I think that the desire to recreate or craft human genomes um, have been projects that have gone wrong in history. So I, I feel that we should be humble in the face of all, all of that. Hello. Two mics, two places. Two mics. Uh, okay. I heard you mention jazz. <laughs> jazz, yes. Now, how does jazz really help you? And is it the jazz of John Coltrane, Miles Davis, or Corolla Armstrong? So, uh, big names. Uh, uh, it's all of that. Um, you know, I think obviously the. Uh, um, Obviously, uh, it was anyone who's spent some time thinking about Indian classical music understands that there are rich intersections with jazz. Um, uh, I like to think about how uh, these might have evolved. Uh, if you imagine music as a kind of genetic strain, it isn't. I'm just saying that as a metaphor, um, how could these two things of music which arose in totally different places uh, 
have evolved in directions that are surprisingly similar? What does it tell us about us as humans that we want to listen to something created on the spot? We, we are in, an, in a culture where virtually everything is available to us in a kind of digital or simulacrum. We see images, we don't see the real thing, we see, and yet uh, we crave going to a performance where the performer is right there, making music right there. What does it tell us about ourselves? I don't know, it's a fascinating idea. Uh, why did these two places that are so far away from each other place such a premium on spontaneity, uh, on mistake making, uh, mutation? Why is it that we uh, find that pleasurable? Why is it we find, uh, I don't know the answers there, but the questions fascinate me. Yeah. Sorry, I'm stuck. Yes. May I please ask a personal question? My name is Sunita Kohli. Uh, you said, uh, you didn't say, I think, therefore I am, but you said, I read, therefore I write. Yes. Do you have um, a set time for writing? Or uh, is there some discipline to your writing, if I may ask? There's a discipline to nothing in my life, so. <laughs> That's so true, but I was wondering since, you know, you're uh, a doctor, well, so, you musician. Know, I try, uh, obviously we are brought and torn in different directions. Um, I try to carve out time every day if I can to write something. I will probably write something every day. Um, I mean, most people who write, I think, realize that the real, the, the real place for writing is editing. Uh, you can produce a lot. But what you keep is, is what makes a difference between, generally between people who produce readable writing and people who produce unreadable writing, frankly. Um, and so, so I think anyone who is, um, it's what you take away from the page rather than what you leave on the page that's important. So I spend a lot of time going back, going back and going back, and ultimately someone has to pull the manuscript out of my you know, cold hands before, I, um, before it's finally published. So that's my process, but I try to do it every day. Hello. If you were to write science fiction. If I was to write science fiction, how did you know? If you were to write science fiction. If you were to write science fiction. If you were to write science fiction. If you were to Speak into the microphone, yeah. Or shout. I'll repeat your question. No, we won't record. Give him a new mic. If you were to write science fiction, yeah. how would it end? How would it end? Hope. Would it end? In hope, in hope, or in a dystopian world? What do you see there at the end? Yeah, so given you your know, work, given your sort of, you know. Um, I've been, uh, actually, interesting you ask, I've been toying with the idea of writing some science fiction. Um, I've been very inspired by science fiction. I've, written, I've read science fiction all my life. I'm particularly interested in science fiction. I've always been interested in science fiction. And um, um, the point is, you know, I would, uh, the quick answer, and, and I'm going to be blamed for being a cop out again is that I, I, I don't know when you write a novel when you don't know you let the at a certain point of time and this is true for the emperor and for the gene as well that you let the book become your guide you let the characters tell speak back to you that's when particularly in fiction but also in nonfiction you have to once you create them you have to let them speak back to you and that's very important you have to let the book speak back to you this goes back actually to your question as well to your question as well what is the process um, one of the processes is um, uh, is that you let the book speak back to you, let the character speak back to you. Um, in the gene, I didn't uh, didn't know when that book would end. In fact, the end of the gene was rewritten about four times um, because it. When I felt that it was ending, um, I sent early drafts to Meru, and we had a long conversation about it with my editors, etc. And it, felt it hadn't ended in the right place, and then I realized that it had to end in a particular place. Um, actually, that, and I'll tell you the process, and this will help you understand what, what science fiction, or how to write science fiction. I had an instinct that the book had to end in a particular place, um, which is not where it ended. And very late into the process, I figured out that the book had to end where it had begun. Um, in Calcutta with my father's visit. Um, and then, um, and, and really I woke up with this um, idea. Um, I had heard 
years ago, and I don't even remember how I remembered it. I have no recollection. But I remembered uh, this snippet of a line from a, a great uh, musical piece by Kumar Gandhar that I'd heard years ago. It would have been a child. Um, and he was singing. You can find it, actually. If you're interested, I'll refer you to it. It's, you can find it on YouTube. You've got to go back to it. Um, and there's a snippet of a line in which he said, in which he says, I'll translate. You can read the original. Um, um, uh, show me that you can discriminate the notes of a song. Um, uh, and understand that the process of this discrimination is the first thing that we do. I'm translating, you can read it. The chapter is called Bhed Abhed in the book. Um, but I suddenly woke up and realized that this was the place it should end. And that's how I figured it out. It was a really a kind of, uh, I, I felt as if having finished writing this book, I understood now about 30 years after I had l heard the, sign, the song, the two lines, 30 years later, I suddenly figured, oh, oh gosh, I've, I've, I've begun to understand it. It took me 30 odd years to figure it out. So uh, you let a book speak back to you, I think, ultimately. Thank you, um, Dr. Mukherjee. That was fantastic. Just uh, you've spoken about, sorry, I'm Nalini Singh. You've spoken about uh, human emancipation. You've spoken about liberation from suffering. Now, just want to know, so the flip side of that, uh, so is there a happiness gene, and can you intervene? And also, at the moment in India, we are in great uh, need for a gene that will suppress arrogance. So is there such a gene? No, right. I wish there was. I wish there was, but there isn't. I'm sure there isn't. Um, uh, I'll give you a gene for happiness if you can define happiness for me. How about that? It's like a young expression. That's politician's answer. So don't give that. No, no, I, I'm very serious about it. I th I'm very serious. It's not a apology. It's in fact, but you know. I'm sorry, but you've spoken about emancipation, um, liberation from suffering. You've spoken about the precision of science. You've spoken about uh, human emancipation. So you, you can define happiness in, you know, sort of maybe in five parameters or something to yourself. Well, and then I'm, can you do something? But, but the reality is that, in fact, I think, and this is an important point, and I write about this, if you, in fact, there's a whole chapter to some extent dedicated to this. It's the last of the manifestos in, in, in the book, which is, I, I write this, I'd say the human genome is narcissist reflected. Um, if you define a quality narrowly, and if that quality is heritable, I can give you a gene for it. I'll give you an example. If you define blue eyes, eyes being blue, and if you know that that is heritable, then I can give you a gene for it. If you define a quality widely, and if it's not heritable, it's very unlikely that I will be able to gene, give you a gene for it. Um, and that's true across many things, <laughs> you know. Uh, 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 and happiness certainly fills that criteria. Um, so I'm not, this is not a politician's answer. I, think I believe very deeply in this idea uh, that the narrowness of the, or the width of the definition of a feature allows us to determine whether that feature is or is not genetically um, inherited. If I, in an absurd world, if I was to define a beauty as only having blonde hair, um, sure, I could find a gene for beauty, but that would be a world in which you and I <laughs> would find, may find, uh, non-tenable. Um, similarly, if I were to say that happiness is only having certain parameters, very narrow parameters of success, only being six foot three inches tall, I'm not, so I would be unhappy by those criteria. 
But if I were to say happiness is six, being six foot three inches tall, sure, I could find some genetic correlates of that. <laughs> arrogance, I think sadly, similarly. Uh, um, maybe arrogance can be more narrowly defined than happiness. <laughs> yes, now I'm getting exhausted, so maybe we'll get one more question. My name is Shahid. You talked about deep learning yeah. and how computers can think like humans. Would computers get cancer? What would be well, akin to a computer idea. getting yes. cancer? Well, you know, that's an interesting idea. Could computers get cancer? You know, uh, Maybe uh, a corrupt code that evolves with learning? Well, you know, we certainly know computers can get infected, um, viruses and so forth. Um, do computers get cancer? Well, you know, the learning algorithms uh, don't have a growth component to them. So in an evolutionary sense, it would be hard to imagine, you know, what could cancer be without growth? Um, but you're asking a different, perhaps, perhaps you could widen the question. The question could be, could, a, could an algorithm become demented? Could they have dementia? And I suspect that you could. I suspect that there could be reasons that your algorithms could have dementia. I suspect, I don't, I don't see why not. If the nature of learning is a particular way and if there is a decay, which is usually the case in dementia, I suspect that, it's an interesting question. I suspect cancer would not be the right place to go. I suspect dementia or having a kind of a psychosis. Uh, could a neural network become psychotic? Maybe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Siddharth, for this wonderful evening.